So our series of blessings, uh, the blessing of living a generous life and real life money issues that, that get in the way. The blessing of living a generous life, we, that's, that's the springboard to all of this. Uh, it, it seems to me that every human being deep down knows that that's the case. That even though, we're not just talking about Christians here, we're talking about every human being, and, and, and even folks like, uh, that, have sp- that have spent their life amassing large fortunes, uh, uh, s- somewhere come to a point where they want to give it away, like, like Bill Gates, right? Uh, he, he, he wants to give it away, and he's got great plans to give it away. Why would they do that? Uh, be, because you see, they, they found out that if you just live life for yourself, it's pretty empty. You have to have meaning outside of yourself. And, and, and you begin to have uh, some of that meaning as, as, as you give things away, as you live generously, right? And, and we've experienced this in our own, own life as well. I, I mean, this, just in little things. I, last week I mentioned the, 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 the Halloween t- trick-or-treat or the one I had, right? And, and, and she came to the door, and it was late at night. I knew I wouldn't get any others. And I said, here, take four or five. And her little face lit up behind her. And I, and wow, that made me feel good, right? You have those experiences? It's just little stuff, right? And big stuff. I, I don't know if, if, if you've been able to help the folks I, I, that are affected by the, the storms or affected by the fires, or, uh, but, but, but sometimes you're able to do that, and, and it, gives, it just fills up your life, right? Everyone on the face of the earth seems to know that. And, and amazing things uh, with the human condition is that when we see things like that, we shouldn't be surprised that the Bible says that, right? Because it happens to come from God, it's happened to be true, huh? And, and so with, with, this, with this idea of living a generous life, God, God even doubles down on it. He says, yeah, that's absolutely true, and it's a grace, a gift I give you to live a generous life. And as a Christian, you can live it for the kingdom of God. And nothing you do in the kingdom will ever, ever be done in vain. You will, whatever you do will last an eternity. Now that's significance. Not just for today, but for an eternity, right? That's what he gives us when he calls us to live this generous life uh, in Jesus. Uh, but in the middle of that, we face life, right? And we face uh, uh, things that get in the way of us being able to do that. And that's the real life money issues. I think it's really important that God never just talks in the strat- stratosphere. He never stays in the stratosphere. The reality of Jesus is he took on human flesh, right? He steps into our life uh, and he experiences everything that we do all the struggles, all the hurts, all the pains, all the challenges, Jesus experienced those, right? And he even took them on himself at the cross, even our death, right? And so this God that we know in Jesus Christ is a God of flesh and blood. He, he's taken on flesh and blood. And he, he, he steps into our life and speaks in our flesh and blood. Last week, um, go ahead. Last week, what we looked at was, uh, the, the, was this idea of not having enough, right? That we, we, we kind of live in that place. We're, we're not sure that we're ever going to have enough. And, and it, there was really, I don't have much time between services. You may have known on Sunday morning, you see me running around. I don't have time to say hi very often. And, but, but in the hallway, right after the first service last week, uh, a Christian brother, it was really neat. Uh, he, he came up to me, and, 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 and he was talking about this. And he was trying to apply it in his life. He says, you know... I'm, I'm retired, he says, and I've, I've saved, and he says, and, and now they're telling me I may live to be 100. How do I know when I have enough? Great question, isn't it? How do you know? But if you wait till you think you have enough, though, you'll never live a generous life, isn't that right? It's like having a baby. <laughs> if you wait till you can afford one, you'll never have a baby, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so, uh, so we're having this conversation just real quick, right? And, and we're kind of connecting because I get it, right? God, God lays out this, this wonderful truth with, with the, I mean, what did we talk about last week with not having enough? We say, okay, uh, what you have to remember, first of all, from a logical perspective, we're one of the rich ones, right? If you live in the United States, you're one of the rich ones. 80% of the world lives on less than $10 a day. Ooh, Right? You're one of the rich ones. And Jesus says, and and this is what you do. You give yourself to me first. Then you give me everything else, and you live from that place, right? He gives us this this, this wonderful, these wonderful gifts, right, so that we can take steps in living not in fear, but in our identity as one who is blessed and have everything we need in Jesus Christ. And yet our discussion, just for a few minutes, was trying to flesh that out. 
And, and, I, and I really thought about that all week. And I, I, I want to let you know that God, uh, we're, we're, you know, we're, we're talking about these things that get in the way, these, these real life issues. But, but he gets even more earthy than this in his word. You know, Jesus uh, talks a lot about this money stuff. Uh, and, and he gets earthy about it. But, but, but in his word, he, he gives us uh, uh, things like this. Go ahead, put that up. He, he talks about how this grace of giving is for everyone. So you never don't have enough not to be a part of this gift of giving, to be generous in your life. You, you never don't have, God, God says it's for everybody to live this way. And, and, and he says, how, what does that look like? And, and then he says things like this to us. He says, work on your heart willfully and, and joyfully, right? And then he says, think about it thoughtfully and, and meaningfully. Make it, make it mean something to you as, as you're looking to live in gener generosity with those around you in the kingdom. And, and then he says, and you know, uh, really sit down and, and put some flesh and blood to it. Uh, thinks, think about what God has given you and, and how this can look proportionally in how you give and, 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 and do it in, in a systems way. Uh, we, we know these things are... are, are uh, are wise, right? I, I saw um, a commercial maybe three weeks ago, uh, and it was a, a public address, you know what I mean? And, and I forget which group it was, but they, they were talking about how to teach children about money. And they said, get three jars, and you put a dime in one jar, and you teach them they ought to be saving that a dime from a, a dollar, and they ought to be saving that all the time. And then you put a dime in another jar, and they can help the less fortunate through that. I saw this on TV. It was the craziest thing. I, I was just, and then the other jars, they, they, they can spend it any way they want. And I flash back to when I was just a little kid and in, in, in grown up in a congregation when they first started uh, children's uh, uh, messages there. This guy brought out three jars. <laughs> and he, he, he says, this is what you do with kids. You teach them. They put a dime here to save because that's smart. And they put a dime here to give to the kingdom. And the rest of it they can spend. It was the same type of thing. It was systems, see? We know this stuff is smart. And God guides us in his word. He's, it's flesh and blood stuff. See, he talks to us up here in these wonderful, stratospheric, uh, philosophical, spiritual realities. And then he brings it down to us so we can live it out in flesh and blood. In the, in the packets we're giving away, if, if, you're, if you're part of us, you remember, uh, it, it lays all this stuff out of us. If you want, lays all this stuff out that I'm talking about here with the Bible passages and everything. But I just wanted to mention it. And if you're, not, if you're a guest today and you want one there on the green table, you can grab one. Um, but I, I wanted to mention, after that conversation, it was, it was so freeing for me to talk to a Christian brother who was wrestling with this like I wrestle with it all the time in my life. What does it mean for me? And to understand that God steps into our lives and, and, and he, he wants to have that conversation with us. And by the way, if, if you want to have a conversation on this stuff, uh, indicate that on your card, and we'll just, we'll just sometime throw open a time period. Uh, Sunday afternoon, Saturday morning, we'll just, we'll just do it once, and we can just sit down and, and, and talk. Uh, because it was so freeing, and, and, and I wanted to share that with you and say, hey, that's what God does for us. And on top of all this, he, he gives us these promises like this. You will be enriched in every way, so you can be generous on every occasion. Isn't that a great promise? And all of these promises that he gives us finally flows into the greatest promise of all time that was kept 2,000 years ago on a cross for you. God keeps his promises, right? Even though it costs him the suffering and death of his only begotten son, he kept his promise to you. See, that's, is that, you know, who, who, you, who can you trust, you know? It's, it's like that, that Ghostbusters movie, right? Uh, who, who are you going to call? Right? Who are you going to trust here? And, and God says, hey, you can trust me. Isn't that cool? Uh, and, and when Jesus stepped into the world, he, he says, look, everything I'm talking about, how, how to live generously, how to, 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 to give away what I've given you, however you want to say that, there's this gift of giving. It's not because I need anything, he says. It's because I want this relationship with you, I want your heart, I want your soul, I want the, 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 the word, the Greek word is nephesh. I want your life source tied to me, see? It, Jesus teaches on this stuff, and he says where your treasure is there, where your heart be also. It's all about us. Everything God does is always out of his love for us. There was this rich guy that came, to, rich young guy came to Jesus, 
And he says, Lord, what do I have to do to get in the kingdom? Jesus says, well, he was, you know, he was trying to show him, so he says, well, keep the commandments. And the guy says, I've done it all. Which, obviously, he didn't, but that's what he thought of himself, right? I've, I've done it all. Jesus said, I'll, I'll tell you what you do. Sell everything you have, give to the poor, come follow me. And it says there that before Jesus said that, it says he loved him. Why would he say that? He wanted his heart. This trust relationship, this heart relationship. He wanted his soul. He, he wanted his life source, his nefesh tied to himself. That's what we were created for, you see? We were created to have life tied to God in this way. And it's what we lost. It's what we lost when Adam and Eve turned away from God. It's what sin does. It, it isolates us apart from God. And, and, and it separates us from each other because we treat each other so poorly, right? And we know something's missing. We have that empty feeling. We keep looking for meaning. Like people all over the globe say, yeah, we got to have more than just me. Let's, let's, let's start giving it away. And, and it, it makes us feel a little better. See, they're looking for it. But it's only found in Christ. And God comes to us, his spirit, every time we talk about this and he touches our hearts right now with this truth that this is what life is supposed to be about, this relationship, this heart connection with Almighty God and through him in this life of loving generosity to those around us where your treasure is. There will your heart be also. This, uh, these verses from Timothy, are the devotions I wrote up, I call them a golden nugget because I, I think they're kind of hidden in this tiny little book called First Timothy. It's towards the end of the New Testament. Most of the time, we don't even know it's there, right? But hidden away in this are these words, and it's really pretty awesome. It starts like this, command those who are rich. Now, command. As Americans, we don't like to be commanded, Right? You're telling me what to do, pal? It doesn't work that way. You know better than I am, right? That's how we are as Americans. At least that's how I grew up, right? Maybe, maybe you guys are a lot better than me. But that's how I, I, what do you mean command? But we need to remember that every command of God comes from his love. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. It's a command, isn't it? But through that command, his spirit touches our hearts and enables us to trust him to have faith in him, to have life in him. You see, every command of God is given through his love for us. Of love we finally see in Jesus and what he did for us. This says, command those who are rich in this present uh, world. Oh, that's us, isn't it? We kind of established that? We're, we're the rich ones, right? So command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain. Hope, um, hope is, um, in, in the Bible, in the Greek, is hope is a certainty. It's, it, it's a trust, okay? It's, it's the thing you, you stand on. And, and this is saying here, tell them not to put their trust in wealth. Why? Because it's here today and gone tomorrow. Have you experienced that? I mean, things go up and then go down. You have it now and then you don't have it. I, I was thinking this last night and I thought about the 1932 stock market crash and a lot of those, the, the folks that had so much money in the stock market, they were wealthy and overnight they became poor and they jumped out of windows, right? Ten stories up and they killed themselves. Why? Because their trust, their hope was in their wealth. God wants something better for us, see? And, and then on top of it, there's a, there's a certain way in which it is uncertain as well. Because you see, quite frankly, even if our wealth doesn't leave us, one day every single one of us is leaving our wealth. Right? So there's an absolute uncertainty to it. God says, I want something better for you. You don't trust your wealth. Put your hope in God. Trust God, who richly provides us with everything. Read the last three words there. Four Sometimes we miss that. God gives us this wonderful life and he, he supplies us with everything we need. Certainly we're supposed to enjoy this life. And the richest way to live it though is in a way that we're constantly giving his, his grace away. Constantly giving in a generous heart is the best way to live.
This goes on and says this, command them, again another command. W w would you read this with me and, and notice the verse as we do that. One, two, three. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. You see, um, God fleshes it out. He's up here in the stratosphere and then he brings it down. You're, we are to do, to be, and to be. Those are action words. Uh, generous and willing. See, this is, we fill our lives with these things and we're blessed. It, it's never just, uh, it's never just on the whiteboard. <laughs> God doesn't work that way. Even as he stepped into our world, he steps into our lives and he makes it real for us. Uh, in, uh, on Wednesday night classes, we talk with our kids about head, heart, and hands. What that means is we want to teach them stuff about God. We want them to know here. But more than that, we want them to know God. Not just about God. We want them to know him in their hearts, right? And then we want them to live it out of their lives. We want them to do and to be, see? It's why we have them take communion at the beginning of the fifth grade around here. Because we understand in communion we're strengthened to live the life of Jesus, see? To do and to be and to be head, heart, and hands. That's his blessing to us, see? Uh, in this way, they will lay, out, lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age. Now, we think of that, and in our sinfulness, we say, okay, so if I do good stuff here, it means I get good stuff in heaven. That's what it's all about. No, no, that's not what it's all about, okay? There's a, um, a verse in the Old Testament, and it says, God will give you the desire of your hearts. And, and a lot of people say, especially when they're, we're young, we say, oh, that means I get what I want, right? No, the whole context there is that God wants to change our hearts so that his desire becomes ours and so that we live for his desires in the kingdom that will never end. What this is talking about is that as, as we day by day take those flesh and blood steps to treasure what he does, the foundation on which we walk here and now, this foundation of trust becomes stronger and stronger and stronger. Uh, there's a, 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 a story in the Old Testament and, and this woman, uh, the, the prophet Elijah, uh, he comes to her and says, I, I, want, I want to eat something. And there's a, a famine, and, and she's only got a little bread or a little oil and a little flour. She says, well, I was just going to make one more cake for my son and I, and I figured we'd die, but I'll make it for you, you know, and I'll make, we'll each have a little one. And she makes it, and she looks, and, and she, she uses it all up, but then it's all there again. Now, that happened the first day, and then it happened the second day, and then it happened the third day, then it happened the fourth day, then it happened the tenth day, then it happened the twentieth day. And every single day, she stepped out in faith on that, see? So the foundation that she was building on became stronger and stronger as she walked by faith. See? That's what this is talking about. It's a gift for us to live the way so that we may take hold of the life that is truly thine. Go ahead. This is our focus, the blessing of living a generous life. And what we're talking about each Sunday is this and real life money issues that get in the way. So this is the real life money issue we're gonna look at today. Everybody wants a piece of me. Worry versus grace. This is supposed to be a salesman knocking at your door. What's the first thought you have when a salesman knocks on your door? Put up the antenna, man, right? Not getting to me. He wants a piece of me, not happening, right? Isn't that what happens when the, when the salesman is, and, and not only is it somebody knocking on the door, uh, but, but, but then you have the people with the, with the emails, right? They're getting pretty tricky these days, by the way. And you have the folks calling on the phone, except we, we, we're pretty smart. Sometimes they don't open the door, and sometimes we say, oh, no, 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 you can't call me anymore, huh? And so we be, just because it's wise in our world, we begin to develop this, this way of looking at it. Everybody wants a piece of me, and I have to be on my guard, right? I mean, the church is the same way, right? We say, hey, bring some food for the, for the folks that don't have enough food. Uh, do, do, do a box. We'll send it over to kids that don't have anything. Uh, bring some socks for the homeless. Oh, we're going to talk about money. The church 
just wants a piece of me too, right? Next month, every store you go in, what are they going to have? Those little guys with the bells ringing? Everybody wants a piece of me, right? And so we have this attitude that, that in one sense, is, is kind of wise in our world. Because like Benjamin Franklin said, uh, a fool and his money is soon parted. Remember that? We don't want that to be us. So we have this attitude. But you know, sometimes, sometimes it's good to turn away from this attitude. I, I remember in, um, in Colorado, I don't know if they do that here, but uh, towards the end when my kids played like little league baseball and football and stuff before they got into high school, uh, all of a sudden the, the, they would give you 10 cards for each kid, right? And you owned those cards, 10 bucks a piece. You either gave them $100 that you took out of your pocket or you hit up 10 of your best friends and got a piece of them, right? Do, do, do they do that here? I'm, I'm just curious. I, I just, it, it was a new thing for me. Gr growing up, we sold stuff, but it was never like, here you go, you own it, right? <laughs> and then when they got into high school, it's the same number of cards, except they doubled the value, $20 a card, right? So now it's the same deal. You own them. You either take it out of your own pocket, or you get 10 of your best friends and family to get a piece of them, right? Jane and I decided that... Um, no matter who asked us, no matter what kid in the church or what kid in the neighborhood, whoever knocked on our door, we were going to buy whatever they sold. Why would we do that? Because we thought it was more important to support the kids. Now, now that wouldn't be for everybody, right? But that's what we decided. We're going to put this attitude down for that. I remember, um, I was really honored. I, I was surprised and honored. But my son, when uh, my youngest son James was going to get married, he, he said, Dad, would you come to me to pick out, with me to pick out the ring for Kayla? I thought, wow. I, mean, I was amazed that he'd have the old guy do that. You know? so, so I said, sure. So we went, and he, uh, James works for Crew, and uh, this one guy that he uh, worked, young guy we worked for in Campus, Campus Crusade, he knew his, the father was a jeweler, so that's where he went. So I'm kind of sitting over here in the corner trying to let James do his thing, you know. I, I didn't want to barge in, and, and he's talking with this guy. He's looking through all the catalogs, looking at all the rings. And, and after about, I don't know, 20, 30 minutes, he comes over to me, and he says, Dad, and he's really very, very thoughtful. He says, I really like this ring. And I said, oh, you think Kay oh, Kayla would love it? And he says, I said, well, good. And he says, but you know, it's, it's $400 more than we said we were going to spend. And, and, and I said, well... How long do you think she's going to wear it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then I said, you know, James, in two years, you'll never know you spent the 400. Right? You see, there's sometimes when it's good to put this attitude away. Especially when it comes to the kingdom of God and living generously as a follower of Jesus in our world. You know the story of the feeding of the 5,000, probably more like seven or 8,000, right? But lots of times we don't think about what came just before that, all right? The context. The disciples had been sent out two by two by Jesus. And, and they went into the countryside, the, the, the towns and the, uh, the, and the villages everywhere. And they were two by two, they were alone, and, and they proclaimed the kingdom. And remember back then, people had a thirst for it. So everybody wanted a piece of what they were hearing, right? And so they were coming to them, and they, they were healing people of their illnesses. They were given power to do that. So all the sick people came, and they were casting out demons. So all those who were demon-possessed came, right? Everybody wanted a piece of them, and they had just got back from that. And they were worn out. They were beat. They were tired at the end of their rope. And Jesus said, come on, let's go to a quiet place, and we'll get you guys some rest. And so they did. They, they went out to a quiet place. The problem was the crowds got there ahead of them. They followed him, right? Now I can just see the disciples, you know, they're saying, what's going on here? Give me a break, right? And, and, and yet Jesus doesn't seem to see how weary they are. What he does see is the, are the crowds. He says they're like sheep without a shepherd. He had compassion on them, and he started to tell them about the kingdom. All day long he tells them about the kingdom. And they all come, they, 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 want, a, they want a piece of that, see? And, the, I can, and towards the end of the day, the disciples are saying, okay, we've got to do something here. We're tired. Uh, Jesus, Jesus, you've got to send them all away 
uh, because they don't have any food to eat. And there's no place out. You just got to send them away. See, we need some rest, Jesus. And Jesus said, no, no, why don't you guys feed them? <laughs> and, 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 Jesus, and, and they said, well, wait a minute. We, we can't feed them. We don't have enough money, and there's no place to buy it. Just send them away. And Jesus says, well, what do you do have? Go check it out. And they said, well, we, they found this little kid, and he had five loaves and two fish. This is all we got. Jesus really has to send them away now, right? And, and, and he has to give them some rest. Jesus said, no, start handing it out. Set the people down in groups of 50s and 100s so they can talk to each other, have, have some relationship, right? Uh, and, and you just start handing it out. And he blessed it. They started handing it out and handing it out and handing it out, and they fed everybody, right? And this is what it says towards the end of that. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up, read the rest of it with me, 12 basketfuls of broken pieces of bread and fish. Now this is what I think those basketfuls meant. In Jesus, there will always be plenty of pieces to go around, no matter how many people want a piece of us. In Jesus, there's always plenty of pieces to go around. You see, the disciples only saw their limits. Jesus saw the need of the people. The disciples only saw what they couldn't do and how limited they were in that. Jesus saw the limitlessness of his power and grace and kingdom. And that's what he wanted his disciples to learn and to live in. You take what you have and you begin and God will multiply it in his grace. Another time Jesus had a big crowd together. He talked about worrying. You know, I think it was Socrates said that uh, repetition is the mother of learning. In this section from Matthew, he, he must use the word worry 10 times. There's no way you can miss it. He's talking about worrying. He says, don't worry about this. Don't worry about that. Don't worry about the other thing. Don't worry about this. And, and then at the end, he kind of he, he, he uh, uh, says the whole thing in one little paragraph, right? So he says, don't worry about what you eat or drink or wear or anything about your life. Don't worry about it. Why? How can he say that? Because you're in his hands, right? And, and he finishes up with this. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. Live in his grace. Live in his generosity. Work in his kingdom. Make his heart your heart. Cherish the things he does. It's the most blessed way to live. Oh, and, and you'll have everything you need. Don't worry. And yes, Jesus... We'll take this from the stratosphere and he will help us flesh it out. This is one of the most foundational readings in the Bible about these. He says, hey, yeah, yeah, just uh, uh, begin systematically to do something, right? He, he enters into our flesh and blood and he says, just take a step. Just take a step. Uh, Jesus, he says this, put my words into practice. Just take a step. And then you'll have the faith to take another step and another one and you'll grow in this stuff. Put my words into practice. Let this amazing things that we talked about touch your mind and heart. And then in flesh and blood, let his word guide you to take a step. To grow, to excel in this life of giving in the name of Jesus. Oh yeah, we, we got things, everyday struggles that get in the way. One of them is this, everybody wants a piece of me. What do we do with that? We don't worry. We seek the kingdom. Remember the five loaves and two fish. And we live in the power of his grace. So, this week, where is uh, worrying that everyone wants a piece of me and the knee-jerk reaction this brings getting in the way of you living a grace-filled, generous life? 
as a child of God through faith in Jesus Christ by the power of the Holy Spirit, turn away from worry and seek the kingdom, remembering the five loaves and two fish and 12 baskets full of pieces that were left over. Put the words of Jesus into practice. Take a step of faith as you look to grow, to excel in this grace of giving. As you joyfully look to live in the blessings of a generous life. And may God's spirit lead you and touch you and guide you this week. Amen.